I want to applaud Hugh's talk because when I hear a fellow physician who is concerned about these issues in terms of prevention and not just treatment, because my own colleagues in neurosurgery, we're, we're in a minority, Hugh and I, and we hope to be able to spread uh, this message that is advanced in we, as we are in our technologic medical environment today, it is equally as important that the technology that we use to treat our patients is also potentially harmful for us and that we need to, hopefully, that you'll take home from this talk, the concept that it's a, it's a, it's a balance and we're trying to achieve this balance between our rapidly advancing technology and also taking into account the potential harmful effects. So today I'm going to um, delve into the greater details of electromagnetic fields and the effects of um, 5G cell towers on the brain and central nervous system. And how did I get involved in this? Well, full disclosure, my wife several years ago found out that she had electrohypersensitivity. Uh, that's an entity where um, they can actually feel cell towers, they can feel dirty electricity, they can feel the effects of even having a phone on in a car. Uh, work people could come to the house and uh, we had a sign on the door that said, please turn off all cell phones and devices. And she would have a sensation and ask them, is there something that's potentially on? And sure enough, it might have been an iWatch or an iPad that was in their briefcase that was still on transmit mode. And there are, I'll get into this, everybody is potentially electrohypersensitive, but some are simply more sensitive than others, as in some are symptomatic, more symptomatic than others. So in 2019, we attended this environmental conference in Scotts Valley. That's where I met Deborah Davis, who I owe a debt of gratitude for getting me involved in this um, in this arena of electromagnetic magnetic fields, and then the energy and camaraderie that was that was present at that conference was really impressive to me. And so um, there were some major players also in um, environmental health in Tucson, and we decided to put on a conference in 2021 that was going to be live, but then it was scuttled by COVID but we had it virtually, and I think we had something like several thousand participants online. Deborah spoke, I moderated. It was really a wonderful conference of great minds from all over the globe and participants from all over the globe participating in this. So it's an, it's an honor to be here and, and be involved uh, in this work. So um, segueing from Hugh's talk, as he said, we have, to prevent, we have to protect the vulnerable, and children are more vulnerable to wireless electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation comes from cell phones, it comes from Wi-Fi, it comes from 5G, it comes from Bluetooth. And so the children have thinner skulls, they have a higher water content because the developing brain, ultimately our brains are predominantly lipid, are fat, but a developmenting, a developmenting, a developing brain has more water than fat, and as they age, they produce myelin, that's the coating around the nerve sheath, and that's a fat-based membrane, and so they're vulnerable to all of this electromagnetic radiation at a rate that's five times higher. Stem cells are also affected. What are stem cells? Stem cells are pluripotential, meaning a stem cell be can become anything. It has the potential to become a bone cell or a nerve cell or a blood cell. And in children, their stem cells are found to be more impacted by radio frequency. And so the diagrams that you see on the right are from Fernandez, who also um, did the same study with um, the sperm count that Dever showed in the prior slides. And so ultimately, our er organs, nervous system, and Undeveloped organs are more vulnerable. As Hugh mentioned also, behavior, memory, learning are also affected. 
American Academy of Pediatrics already noted, and this is old news, right, but 30 minutes of just increasing screen time with increased risk of extensive speech delay, memories affected. We have Europeans involved, ADHD, as he mentioned, with the perinatal studies in five countries, in Northern Europe and Spain, and also the neuropsychiatric effects of over 26 studies showing fatigue, headache, nausea, and symptoms of electrohypersensitivity. Martin Paul um, was a, a pioneer uh, in this field, and um, he's one of the you know, leading researchers in the effects of electromagnetic fields. I unfortunately did not get to meet him. Cell phones, headaches, and migraines. NIH actually funded a research study on over 50,000 children, and both prenatal and postnatal exposure to cell phones had more migraines and headache-related symptoms, and this is actually unusual for um, more mainstream uh, researchers to actually conclude that the findings actually showed that smartphone electromagnetic radiation can actually trigger um, effects. Microwaves produce neuropsychiatric effects, including depression. And so what's the mechanism of this? And, and, and in the interest of time, I had to sort of dial down, um, you know, how does all this happen? Um, what's going on between the electromagnetic fields coming from a cell phone and the cells? And so what's happening is, is that our brains, our bodies, our most vulnerable organs are actually our hearts and brains, are powered cellularly by an energy pump within the cell called the mitochondria. And the mitochondria have membranes. And these cells are affected by these radio frequency fields, and actually the cellular DNA and the mitochondrial DNA are both affected. And so what's happening is, is there's a stress reaction. And so the cells are literally stressed, and then we have things called voltage-gated calcium channels that, if you can imagine, a cell membrane are radio frequency radiation affects these voltage-gated calcium channels. They're channels where you see molecules going through the cell membranes, and those are all affected. The neurotransmitters are affected, and as Hugh mentioned, hormonally, there's also neuroendocrine cells, and those are also affected. There's a thing called oxidative stress, and so there's a well-known pathway in medicine, which again relates back to the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and there's actually slides that I had to delete that showed how the hydrogen bonds in the helical DNA are affected by radio frequency radiation. Having a brain tumor, whether benign or malignant, is a life-changing event. And so, no matter that we may have the most wonderful surgeries to resect these, no matter that maybe it's a benign tumor and the patient can have a successful resection, it's still a traumatic event for the patient and their family. And it puts them at risk, not only just being in the hospital, but for infection. And so it's really better to go through life without contracting a brain tumor. And what you see here is an aggressive brain tumor. It's likely a, G, a glioblastoma, GBM. You see on the upper right picture, that's the slice through the side, and you can see the white part, and that's where the enhancing um, tumor um, is shown on MRI. They give an agent called gadolinium, which is theoretically a safe bound metal that's excreted in the kidney. But, and then the, the other image is the um, uh, cross-sectional image looking this way. It's the axial image. And so that's just an example of what brain tumors look like. And, and these can present where the patient has been minimally symptomatic and ultimately they'll show up in the emergency room and they can have advanced disease like this. And this is not an uncommon first presentation of what I saw in practice for close to 30 years. And so even though we have death rates decreasing, we're successful in our treatments. We've got newer chemotherapeutic agents. We've got navigation equipment. We have even monoclonal antibodies. We're not going to cure 
high-grade brain tumors. We're not going to cure glioblastoma, at least in my lifetime. And so the brain cancer rate is increasing in both adults and children, 0 to 14 ages. Ostrom is from Duke, the well-known epidemiologist. We also have pediatric brain, kidney, liver, thyroid, all increasing over the last years and also increasing up until now. These are earlier studies. 4,600 people, as in children, adolescents, are diagnosed with a brain tumor each year. And the last line relates back to a Blue Cross Blue Shield study that was published just a few years ago that showed the overall cancer rates are rising profoundly in millennials. So they were 20s to 30s, and now they're approaching 40s, but now we have thyroid and rectal cancers and brain tumors, not to mention suicide, depression, and stroke, all increasing in this population. And as Hugh mentioned, yes, things are multifactorial. Is it solely the effect of our cell phones? No, not necessarily. We have toxins in our environment. But the fact is, is that we have never had more electromagnetic frequency in our globe up until now. In other words, it's never been, this is the highest rate that we have ever achieved in electromagnetic frequency, in ambient environments, in our world, and it's higher than it was when even those studies were published. So I hearken back to the inconvenient truth of our technologic epoch, um, and as Hugh mentioned again, we've got known toxins that commonly occur that we know are harmful. Alcohol, heavy metals, solvents, pesticides, ionizing radiation, the radiation that you would get from an x-ray machine, the radiation that people got in the 50s when they had their feet x-rayed, the radiation that my patients who survived Hiroshima, Nagasaki got and presented with cranial brain tumors. I saw those in my practice over the years, and so, yes, that's a, that's a known entity. But when we talk about science and we talk about this inconvenient truth and people say trust science, we have to look at where that science comes from. There's all kinds of science. And my colleague, a, P a premier neurosurgeon in Australia, Charlie Teo, was quoted in one of our conferences and said, just look at who funds what studies, because those make the difference. And so we have to keep that in mind when we review what's out there in the media, in the literature. And so when I have a colleague like Hugh show up in a meeting like this, it's just especially refreshing. So lastly, as we're now talking about today, the non-ionizing radiation is definitely an issue. So one of the major studies that's referred back to in this arena of radiofrequency is the National Toxicology Program study, 2018, $30 million, 10 years. The conclusion was clear evidence of brain cancer from radiofrequency. And yes, it was a rat model. And of course, those who would like to criticize our interests in terms of our concern about radio frequency point to the fact that it was rats and mice, but gee, we actually share very similar DNA, and there's a host of other therapies that perhaps many people in this room are getting in terms of general cholesterol drugs, antihypertensives, diabetes medicines, chemotherapeutic agents, heart meds, interventions that were all based on rat models. But yet, we have a study that was then reevaluated by the Italians, the Ramazzini study, and was corroborated, and they found that it increases in the same tumor types as the National Toxicology Program. Over the years, I treated a number of tumors in a number of patients, from children, adolescents, to adults. And my gut was always the sense that radiofrequency played a role somehow in the presentation of their tumors. And so I treated acoustic neuromas. The schwannomas that are mentioned here in the NTP study occurred in the heart, but it's a nerve cell tumor, it's a nerve sheath tumor. 
the tumor of the myelin that I mentioned earlier, of the lining of the nerve cell. Those schwannomas can occur in the heart and they can occur in the brain and they occur on the acoustic nerve. And so it was very easy for me to have a patient with an acoustic neuroma because this was an area of my specialty and I'd simply interview them about their cell phone use. And everyone used the cell phone on that side of the body, on that ear specifically. And so all I had to do was warn them going forward, you only now, many of them lost hearing as a result of that tumor surgery just to get the tumor out. We had to potentially sacrifice the auditory nerve. The facial nerve would run right with it. And so it was much more important to preserve the seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve, and sacrifice the acoustic nerve because the nerve tumor had literally grown into it. So that's just an anecdotal thing. And I don't have the numbers to support that, but there are articles in PubMed.gov, and I found them. And there are correlative studies in humans on large numbers that show the cell phone use with correlations with the schwannomas. So we mentioned cell towers. Many of us, most of us, we don't see it. Of course, now we see it. I think it's a blight on our country, especially if it's in a national park. But we didn't used to see it. Now we're seeing it. Uh, we can't feel it. Some of us actually do feel it. Um, I think that when we, um, when we disconnect, when we actually do take digital breaks, when we give ourselves that time away from radio frequency, your bodies actually can feel the effects of a cell tower when driving by it. And so over time, cumulative damage occurs. And the issue, of course, is, is that long term, all of these things are cumulative. And so we can't possibly anticipate what's happening as a cumulative dose over a lifetime. This is a very busy slide, but it's simply up here to show you that as early as in the 1990s, and these are all little reference studies that refer to an article, but as, the, as early as the 1990s, they found effects of radio frequency that involve brain cancer, heart, oxidative changes, reproductive changes, sleep changes, at levels of radio frequency exposure that were all below the recommended FCC and Canadian limits. And so at these low exposures, all of these studies found significant effects. And so the dilemma that we're facing is, is are we looking at a society in which technologically acquired disease is now being treated with high level technology? And so here's an example of my colleague who's chairman of NYU, John Golfinos. He's an outstanding neurosurgeon. This came out last year as an advertisement and a promo for NYU, and they have the best and the brightest of neuronavigation techniques, intraoperative MRI, and we can treat your brain tumor with the best of the best. But the sad part is, is how did we acquire that brain tumor? And, and is this the future of our world, of our society, to simply focus on technological treatments for things that are potentially preventable. This was an NIH study from 2012. I want to preface this by saying that I don't think we've ever seen a smart fish. I'm a, I'm a fly fisherman. And when um, you go fishing, you feel like sometimes you caught the same fish because they go after that fly and they go after it. And so why aren't there smart fish? Well. Oxygen has to diffuse through water into gills, and fish don't have enough oxygenation to develop a brain that can understand logic. But those cetaceans, those mammals, whales, dolphins, porpoises, they come up for air. And they come up for air, and they perfuse their brains with oxygenated blood and they have highly developed central nervous systems. So now, if we look at PET scans in those patients who are exposed to cell phone radiation, and we look at the outcomes, 
we see that they end up metabolizing glucose, which is given to them as an isotope. They metabolize glucose in place of the oxygen. So what does that mean? That means that when the brains are exposed to cell phone radiation, they are not oxygenating well. They have to utilize glucose to process cellular function. And this is as old as 2012. So wireless radiation is, in fact, a neurotoxin. It's toxic to cells. Loss of memory, cells deteriorate in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the inferior part of the temporal lobe that's responsible for our memory. Oxidative stress, I already mentioned. Demyelination. Demyelination is what happens when the lining of the nerve cells in the spinal cord and even in the brain deteriorate. It's the common occurrence that happens with multiple sclerosis. We mentioned oxidative stress already. I think the blood-brain barrier is very important to mention here in terms of what happens to our brains when we're exposed to cell phone radiation. The hippocampus is that area just here uh, below in the inferior temporal lobe. Um, and when we do blood-brain barrier studies, what is the blood-brain barrier, actually? The blood-brain barrier is the microscopic interface of microvessels adjacent to neurons. And so this blood-brain barrier is an integral part of how our brains function and metabolize oxygen and glucose and food. And it's a very delicate thing, and it's something that we learn as neurosurgeons to actually manipulate in terms of head trauma or brain tumor patients when we see patients in the acute setting. And now we have evidence that when we expose brains to microwave radiation, we have leakage out of those vessels that I mentioned in the form of albumin, which is a protein. And we can see on the slide on the left is before the control and after the exposed brain has the leakages of the albumin. We talked about learning impairments. We talked about learning and recall. I think you're getting the idea that there's just enough information out there in terms of multiple studies, in terms of test scores, attention deficit. What's interesting is that cell phones have been banned in certain countries, Israel, Northern Europe, and I think all of those have a lead on potentially our own country here. The question becomes, is artificial electromagnetic fields an environment that's going to potentially unravel the advances that we have made that we have made as human beings, as an evolutionary species. That's really what we're facing here. We're facing an unprecedented electromagnetic field exposure where theoretically we came from apes, but are we going to deteriorate in this environment over time? There have been multiple studies on people living near cell towers, even dating back even before this one. It was an early 200 studies, 200, 2000 study of firefighters adjacent to cell phones with multiple symptoms, brain tumors also. India has actually banned cell towers in higher populated areas. I think we need to take their lead. So how can we reduce exposure? France, Belgium, and Israel have banned the phones in school, and many schools in Israel are actually wired, meaning Ethernet, the cable that you see on the bottom right. Cabling a company, a school, a library, is actually cheaper, more effective, and higher bandwidth than having recurring costs of Wi-Fi routers that are going to deteriorate over time. Devra's organization, the EHT, has been involved in attempting to 
reduce these exposures overall. So, as I mentioned, it's a blessing and a curse because this technology has allowed us to advance in a lot of areas. As a physician, I had to be reachable 24-7, and so what did I do? I put my plane on airplane mode, I set it down, I made rounds in the hospital, I'm constantly turning it on and off, telling other people to turn it off, teaching my patients on how to live with a cell phone, because for many it's their only way of communication. And so it boils down to the judicious use of our technology that can be the least harmful for us. Probably the most important thing I did, I was involved as a young scientist in the committee that actually reviewed the data and recommended that there be no smoking on airplanes. You may be shocked to hear that it was even a question for science at the time, but it was. And when I look at what we know now about mobile phone radiation, I see some very interesting similarities. A growing number of prominent doctors and scientists are raising warning flags over radiation this morning, and your kids could be facing a greater risk of exposure. I think the most important study is a study by the National Toxicology Program in a classic large carcinogenicity test, one of the largest ever performed, and for that matter, one of the most expensive, they found increased risk of the tumors, which we believe radiofrequency radiation is causing in man. Uh, particular tumors called schwannomas, in the rats they were in the heart, in, in humans they're often in the nerve the ear nerve, the vestibular nerve. Cell phone providers say they follow all safety guidelines put into place by the FCC. The current FCC safety standard was developed nearly 20 years ago. The, the manufacturers actually tell people in the instruction manual, which I never read, to put, not to put the cell phone against your ear. It does say exactly that. There's a, the BlackBerry, for example, warns to keep your phone at least 0.98 inches away from the body when transmitting. With, uh, with an iPhone, for example, it's 5 eighths of an inch. At this point, the evidence has become sufficiently strong that cell phone radiation is a human carcinogen. A major development from California's Department of Public Health, high use of cell phones may be linked to certain types of cancer and other health effects, including brain cancer and tumors, lower sperm counts, headaches, and effects on learning, memory, hearing, behavior, and sleep. If it was a real problem, I would know. If it was a real problem, the government would protect us. How come I'm not hearing about this? They're all things I've heard when I give seminars. You know, I get up there and they say, oh yeah, if this was really a problem, they would have told us. I am they. I am a, you know, legitimate scientist and I am telling you.